Welcome. I am here today with a guest who I'm going to be quite honest about makes me a little nervous. So <laughs> let me t explain why. Today's guest is a retired judge and she is someone who had me shaking in my boots when I was a young lawyer a really long time ago. And before I walked into a courtroom, I had to mentally prepare myself because I knew she was going to make sure I showed up on my A game. But on the other hand, her honesty and authenticity and tough love is what makes her so good at what she does. So let me introduce you to Judge Linda Monroe. Judge Monroe had been a judge in Connecticut for 20 years, uh, mostly in family court and complex litigation. She's also an adjunct professor at Quinnipiac Law School. And now she's retired and works at Pullman and Comley as a private mediator on all things family law. So essentially two people come to her, say, we can't figure things out, please help us reach a decision. And people usually listen to her because she knows what she's talking about. So welcome judge. Very nice you, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. And I'm gonna like shake off my nerves by the end of this interview, as long as you don't ask me to like brief something, we'll be good. <laughs> we're all good, yeah. <laughs> so when you were sitting on the bench, and two people walked into your courtroom. Usually they had a big box of emotion and anger and expectation that came with them. And they kind of turned their box over and dumped it on the courtroom floor. How did you sort through all of that in order to reach a decision? You know, it, it, it's a good way to describe it, that it's in a box. It's like a lot of different pieces of paper all together and mixed up. When people come to court for divorce, they're in different stages of the process of coming to grips with the divorce. And a judge really needs to be aware of it. We're not a mental health professional, but you need to appreciate and understand that people go through stages of grief, fear, anxiety, anger, and it's only when they come through the other side of it that they're able to start having a vision of what their life could be like. Um, when they are divorced and are able to accept um, that they've come to this place. So I think what I have tried to do in all my years on the bench is validate that, respect them, leave people with their integrity, understand that whatever their issue they're bringing to me is so very important to them at that moment and give it my full attention. And what does it mean when they say, I want justice? Because as a divorce attorney, often we'll have clients that say, I just want justice. And what does that look like in a divorce? Well, it often doesn't look like what the party is thinking deep inside about what they want for justice. When they say they want justice, they want some kind of vindication of whatever um, arguments or wrongs or hurts they feel from the marriage. And that's really not the place of the courtroom. If you're going to litigate your case, then what you're really doing is you're giving the court, the judge, a picture, a snapshot in time of what the marriage was like, and then only the laws applied. It's got to be dispassionate. It can't be what the party really wants, because then the justice system isn't the same for all if it were colored by each person's personal grievances. And right. So is it fair to say that if someone ends up with something that they kind of hate and are kind of okay with, it's probably something that's fair? You know, lawyers often say if both of the parties are a little miserable, then the mm -hmm. right thing happened. Um, sad to say, it's a rare family in which two households can be supported with the same income that supported one household. So there are real difficult financial realities that need to uh, be embraced and understood. And that's why sometimes it feels like mutual pain. Mm. And how much does emotion factor into a financial outcome? Um, less for the judge, a lot more for the parties. Emotion is... Emotion, emotion doesn't really belong in the courtroom in the sense that it belongs in the therapeutic environment. Um, it, is the, it is the vehicle that parties use to express their positions. And in the court, there's a kind of solemnity, a kind of formality, which ends up meaning that there's um, little emotion, sometimes some peak 
Um, but that's why the judge really needs to appreciate and understand and empathize with the party's position without having to hear it all emoted at that moment. Right. And so usually a really a highly emotional issue are parenting schedules and parenting plans. And sometimes two people aren't coming from a bad place. They both want as much time as possible with their child and they just can't figure it out and they would end up in front of you. What do you do with something like that when they're both good parents? There isn't any reason that one shouldn't have as much time as possible, but they just really can't get to an agreement. How do you get to the bottom of what a parenting plan should look like? Well, as you know, Renee, I spent the lion's share of my time at uh, the, the contested custody docket, and I saw endless situations like that. The focus needs to be not on what the parent wants, but what the child or children need. It really needs to be a child-focused decision. And we know that when you have two good enough parents, that the children need the benefit of both of them, uh, the parenting of both of them. You know, when, when folks live in a house together, uh, unconsciously, one parent sort of covers for the other. One's good at this, the other's good at that. And it's really ideal if they can have enough respect and flexibility for each other when they're uh, in the separation phase, where they can try to try to um, create that kind of uh, outcome again for the, for the kids, because then the children have gotten the best of everything. And is that possible even if you have two different parenting styles? Which Absolutely. often happens. You had two different parenting styles in the home. And so, I mean, remember that, um, wait till your father get home, gets home because, right. right? One of you is um, in the 1950s notion was the disciplinary and the other one was maybe the uh, more nurturing. But both are valid. Both are needs of the ch uh, child or children. Mm -hmm. And it's the rare person who's a parent who can do everything perfectly mm -hmm. well all the time. And I, I always tell clients that that other per parent is your support system. That's the parent that you call when you need backup, especially as your kids get older and when they're teenagers. Oh my God, with adolescence, you've got a consistency, 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 or they will play you and manipulate you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And they're the person to call if you can't get them from uh, from school on time or, you know, you need help. or You need coverage because you have to work late or something. And uh, so often I think people are battling each other rather than looking at each other as an ally because they're so caught up in how they feel about each other. It's it's the adult stuff that gets in the way of the child focused thinking. And that's why where a parent is in the process of divorcing, whether they've got the skill set and utilized tools available in the community to help them understand the process so they can move emotionally forward, so they can then focus again on their child's needs and not their own sense of grievances and harms. Do you recommend parents who are really stuck uh, utilizing a co-parent counselor or, some, or someone like that, or a professional to help them? You know, co-parent counselors, parenting coordinators, um, they, have a t they have a place, but they also have a time. And what I mean by that is they help the parents bridge from the difficult time to where they can rely on each other and see each other as allies and validate each other. So a good co-parent counselor is only on the scene for a while, shouldn't be there forever and gives the parties the strength to feel like, ah, yeah, that's a better decision to call mom or call dad right. or co-mom or co-dad. Are there times where litigation is absolutely necessary when it comes to custody and parenting? Yes, in a funny sort of way. It, it really shouldn't be ever, but sometimes one parent is so entrenched um, that they're dragging the other parent into litigation. And the party who's getting dragged along has no choice but to stand up and, and litigate the issue. It's unfortunate and difficult. There are also times when parents have um, diagnosed entrenched personality problems, which um, make it impossible for them to say empathize um, to appreciate um, that they're manipulating a child 
or doing some other kind of harm to the kids. When there's something wrong with a parent that isn't fixable, then you may need litigation. Mm, okay. And what are options other than litigation when parents have a conflict that maybe they can work out, but they, um, they need a little help doing it? Is there uh, mediation or what other options are available to them? So Renee, when I describe that small group of people who may need to litigate, it's really a very small group. The vast majority of parents find their way to coming to parenting agreements or even on the financial side, financial agreements. It can be done through the mediation process. Mediation uh, can be done with a lawyer in the room or it can be done without the lawyer and just consult. You can have the collaborative process and I'm gonna use a big C and a small C for that. There is a movement called collaborative divorce, that's the big C, where people are committed to working together in an environment together and opting out of litigation as an affirmative step. And then there's the small C collaborative where people do it in a more informal way. It doesn't need a title, it just needs the commitment to get it done. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's so good. And that doesn't mean I think a lot of people have the misconception that in order to mediate or use the collaborative process, they need to come to the table um, in agreement on everything. And that's not the case. That's the whole point of it is to use that process to get to an agreement. So they can come with conflict. That's the whole point, right? If they had an agreement, they, they wouldn't need the intervention of a mediation or the like. What they have to bring to the table is an open mind and a willingness to be flexible and hear that there are other ways to solve their problems. Problems need to be solved in mediation. That's the whole purpose of it. But this puts a mom or a dad or whomever it is in the driver's seat where they feel like they're owning the result and doing it for the benefit of their family, their children. But what if someone has a story that they feel like they need to be told, they need vindication on. So we're, we're talking about finances and maybe a spouse who cheated on the other person and they want to make that person suffer and, and punish them. Um, what would you say to them about going to court? Well, court is always there. It's the last alternative. And it certainly is a place to tell a story, but it's not a place where there is any recognition of the special pain that that person may be feeling. There's so many cases that have to go through the court system. In many ways, mediation is a better environment for that storytelling because the mediator, uh, I do mediation and people do need to tell their story. It's really important for them to be able to and to get some feedback on it. And it's done in an environment where they feel supported and not part of just a continuum of a very busy system. Right. And so when they come to you, do they typically have attorneys as well? I do it both ways. So um, some mediators, um, some people don't feel like they can find their own voice in the room. <laughs> and so they'll have their lawyers in the room and I'll be mediating with the parties and the lawyers. There are other people who have been able to figure out how to find their voice. They'll have a lawyer they consult with. We often call that a review counsel who will go over some principles or ideas with them, but they're sitting and mediating with their spouse um, with just, just myself, the mediator. It, it's a great thing to be able to do, particularly if you have children, because it's part of the process of learning how to speak together again. Mm, right. Are there cases that really shouldn't be mediated? So if someone, if there's a bullying situation in a marriage or if there's domestic violence, are they um, able to mediate successfully or should they steer clear of that? You know, Renee, for a long time, people thought domestic violence cases shouldn't be mediated. And then studies were done um, working with domestic violence advocates. And there was a real understanding that in fact, the mediation environment is a safer environment for the person who may be beleaguered by domestic violence to be able to be heard and to be able to stand up for themselves with a safe neutral in the room. And the outcomes on that um, are very positive. I would say uh, I would not have a mediator uh, who uh, work with a family that has DV in it unless they're 
well educated and attuned and understand the issues of power, uh, co coercion and control that are implicit in domestic violence. Mm. And I would think that going through the process of mediation also is um, less traumatic because a courtroom can be sort of a traumatic experience and people really get overwhelmed and they're sitting in a busy courtroom and people are watching and listening to their story and that in and of itself can be um, can cause some some trauma and anxiety. Absolutely. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Um, so now that we are in kind of a situation where so much is being done virtually, do you think mediation can be done virtually as well going forward? Well, I am mediating on um, virtual platforms. Uh, it, it works. Um, it gives people an alternative. Um, when we go back to um, working um, in close quarters with other people, um, I'm not sure mediation will continue in, with all the vitality it has now on the virtual platform. And, and for some real quick reasons, um, people are not as aware of how much um, the physical presence of another person in reading the room that we do in every conversation. So of course we do it in mediation. And so um, everyone has to work a little harder to be able to replace that with um, real close listening, I think. And so it's a good enough uh, platform for now. It's useful for perhaps for someone who can't travel or has a particular disability that will um, make them want to not travel. Um, but I think in the end, uh, the personal contact matters. Right, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it gets the job done, but I think it does, it's much better. In yeah, yeah. Um, what if, do you have any words for someone who might be listening who's going through a divorce and is just really overwhelmed with the whole process? Any words of uh, wisdom or encouragement for, for them? Well, I, I think the first thing is, is um, I understand you have an educational program. An educational program is absolutely key for someone uh, because it helps answer the questions, it helps order the thinking so that someone can see that there is a you know, light at the end of the tunnel, to use the expression. And um, if they see what the pitfalls are along the way, what the bumps are, and can anticipate them, then I think um, people do much better when, they, when they're in that environment. I think folks have to be patient with themselves. One of the problems in society we know is, particularly in, in the world of everything news 24-7, is people want solutions on a 24-7 basis. And some things need to um, mature and ripen. And one of them is uh, the pro divorcing process. A person has to allow themselves to go through the stages to be able to get to the other side. Um, the, the finances, the parenting plan, that's both law and practicality. Mm -hmm. And so that's education, understanding, and patience. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I think uh, expectations is a really big one too. And if yep. setting proper expectations as to what can reasonably happen, not what you necessarily want to see happen or how much you want you're supposed to sure. suffer, but yep. what, what can happen and having that conversation. Do you find that that um, is kind of an indicator of whether someone can mediate successful, successfully or um, if they have improper or unreasonable expectations, they go to court looking for a result that will, they'll never receive. Well, I think that it, that happens sometimes. One of the problems um, that people suffer from is, is um, because they have unreasonable expectations and no professional has sort of re-educated them, um, they, do, they feel wronged by whatever is being discussed. And so there needs to be a re-education. And if it's unsuccessful, if they either can't hear it or it's not being presented well, we'll see that person litigating their case. Um, on parenting, it's very often a psychoeducation. Uh, parents need to have a real understanding of developmental needs of children and why it is important for children to have two active and interested parents and why outcomes are so much better for children who do. And 
Um, I think that's hard to hear sometimes when you're, you're mad at the other parent. And so time, education, expectations. I like that word. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to raise a sort of a word that also gets thrown out a lot is the word alienation. We hear that um, and it's sort of casually tossed around. Can you explain your experience as to what alienation actually is and maybe what it's not? Yeah, so um, I've probably had the fortune or misfortune of having tried a lot of um, alienation cases where it's either alleged or actually exists. So it is almost inevitable as parents divorce that little unintentional slights um, about the other parent come across. Um, it's not a real quote, case of alienation if when pointed out, the parent corrects themselves because they don't want to harm the child. When it, real alienation exists or where a child rejects a parent, which is what we're really talking about, it's because the child has some perception of some horrible harm or wrong that the parent did that is really out of proportion. For instance, if someone was 10 minutes late to pick up their child and the child finds that's the reason to never see that parent again, that's a danger sign. And I don't make that story up. That's a real story. So what's being fed into the child's mind is a kind of um, demonization of the rejected parent. And this often happens where the parent who's sort of sheltering the child um, has um, put, parentifies the child, needs the child, the child feels they need to protect that parent. And so you have a very, very unhealthy dynamic. You know, alienation as a word is neutral. Every once in a blue moon, there is a reason for a child to reject a parent. And the question is, can the reason be fixed? Mm -hmm. um, and those cases are what some of the uh, academics call justified alienation. So it's a real continuation, but what you're really looking for in the dangerous cases is where the child's understanding and rejection of a parent is just, it is skewed, it's inappropriate. It's like, a, it's almost like a prejudice. Mm. And the, the casual use of alienation is not what you're talking about here too. No, no. Yeah. And that's why everyone should see that there are just lots of different, different things that happen in the process. And parents need to be sensitive. If it's time for uh, Jane or Johnny to go visit the other parent, it shouldn't be presented as a negative or something you have to do. It should be presented in a positive light. It's time for fun. It is time for um, you to have some good reading time with, with mom or dad. Um, an affirmation of the relationship needs to occur. A parent should have pictures for the child in the house of that child with the other parent. Mm, that's a tough one. Yeah. These are the things that if you're really paying attention to your child's needs, you'll do. Right. It's not about you. Well, say ultimately it comes down to what's best for your child and not what's best for you or how you feel about it. And I yeah. think that a lot, so many parents struggle with that. Yeah. And, and those are the ones who end up back in court time and time and time again until their child is 18 years old, unfortunately. There are, there are entrenched high conflict cases yeah. and the best that a judge can do for them when they're a high conflict family is to make very explicit court orders uh, with nothing left to the imagination so that the rules get followed. Mm, yeah. So that the child doesn't live with the parents going back to court over and over and over again. Right. And because what's the outcome of that high conflict in that child's life long term? Right. Right. The studies are clear. It's not good. It is not good. It's not good for them in terms of their performance in society or their ability to have a healthy relationship with another adult in the future. Right. Right. And how much of that um, plays into or played into your role when you were a judge, the level of conflict between the parents? I mean, was there a time where the conflict was so high that co-parenting was completely ineffective and uh, neither of them had the, the, the maturity or ability to parent so that you had to make a different decision. 
Yes, but I will say that it's, I'm going to emphasize again, this is the rare small percentage of cases. I happen to have sat on the statewide docket where I saw the worst of the worst from around the state and where I had to intervene in issue orders, which uh, took the child out of the conflict and got the people um, to have no recourse where they would only go forward. You try a variety of other things first. You try to get them to... Um, to co-parent counsel, you try a psychoeducation. I might provide for parallel parenting. Okay, you can't talk to each other, but you go on parallel tax, tracks and maybe we'll get it done. But by the time you get to that docket where I was, very often you end up having to, to make some hard calls, which are really unfortunate. And in case someone doesn't know what parallel par parenting is, could you explain that? Sure. Uh, it, it's an expression that, you know, if you ever watch little kids play there, it's side by side and uh, little babies and they play well without recognition that the other person is there. Mm -hmm. Well, on parallel parenting, each parent parents the children in their own domain and there is no need um, or ability for interaction because the interaction is unhealthy, but the child alone with each parent does well. You might give, a, um, um, you. I talk like you're a judge, I'm sorry. The judge might give spheres of influence from one parent uh, is in charge of education, the other parent is in charge with religious upbringing. I use those by way of example. That's parallel parenting because um, they're both doing all right, not as well as you'd like, but all right on their own, but they show no capability of working together. So this isn't something that someone should really be seeking. I mean, this is like kind of a last resort. Type oh my thing. God, no! This is this is uh, part of the parade of horribles, and I'd like to think that most people who are going right. to listen to this or work with you um, may have some small struggles along the way, but with a little bit of help, uh, can figure it out. And so, my final question for you is: What does a successful divorce look like? Well, a successful divorce with kids looks like a child who's really, really happy to have both parents at school events, at graduations, when they get married, and going forward. Because that means those parents, well done. They raised uh, a um, secure child, and they did it because they divorced su successfully. Financially, both parties uh, feel enabled to uh, move forward with uh, a sense that the other parent was treated fairly and they were treated fairly, even if it's a little unhappy pain for both of them. Right, right. That's perfect. It's a great answer. Thank you so much. Uh, if someone wants to reach out to you or have you be their mediator, they can find you on the Pullman Conley website, which I'll have the link in the show notes here. Thank you so much, Judge Monroe, for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank it you. It was my pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. It was fun, Renee. Thank you. Thank you.